some questions? I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, Cathy. Brilliant. Yes, there is uh, questions and comments coming in. And just like to say a huge thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, and uh, we've got people tuning in from all across Ireland. Uh, say a big hello to Francie in Belfast, uh, Tomas in Clare. Um, Cathy's following on from Tomas, uh, his talk last week. But some really interesting comments. And again, everyone, um, I have... Facebook, I'm monitoring, so if anyone has any more questions, throw them in. Um, but Eamon Bone, hey Eamon, how's it going? Um, Eamon just uh, made a comment earlier, Cathy, and you, you did really set the scene, and that's one thing you always do. You really describe the areas because they are so different 100 years ago. Um, but Eamon Bone uh, just made a comment that the houses, some of the houses in Camac Place, um, they're built by the British military uh, to accommodate... Oh some of the wounded soldiers that had returned from the, the Western Front, um, mostly those who had actually won or been awarded medals. What? The, the British Legion looked after them until the 1930s. Um, and then we have Dermot uh, Bretnock. Hey, Dermot. Um, and he chatted to a man who knew someone who worked in Inchicore Works <laughs> um, and he was told that he saw a grenade mould. Um, are there any surviving artefacts? Um, well, I know myself, there are surviving uh, grenade moulds. Some of them are like the photographs of them. I know there are some from the country, Dermot. Um, Martin Bob O'Dwyer, I think, in his one of his Tipperary books, um, had one. And Porrick Ogo Rourke, in his book, Revolution, uh, there's a photograph of the grenades that were made by the IRA. And, and Kathy, they had these foundries across the, the, the city as well. Yeah. yeah, they did. There's certainly one in Thomas Street. I know that for a fact. Um, but I think it's the skill set, Liz. It's more the skill set that people who had worked in the Inchicore works over the since the 18 the middle 1800s and um, so the, the area had people who were skilled in foundry work railway work um, working in a molding working in a you know in, in, in working with steel working with uh, anything like that and these these skills transfer over very nicely when you're trying to run a revolution or run a war of independence whatever it is you're running um, and we made full use of it quite obviously um, and certainly you would have had people from the Liberties working out in Inchicore. We, we get accounts of people you know getting to work going up by the old canal things like that and um, so as I say we, we drew on our strengths we drew on what we had and certainly they used fire as a weapon because at this stage ammunition for guns is a problem and it, it is a problem it's an acknowledged problem um, for the the IRA at this stage, um, and you know even the source had dried up because after World War One, an awful lot of the returning soldiers dumped their arms in the direction of the IRA. But we're now in 1921. We were we're a good few years post World War One. That source had dried up too, and I'd suspect the British authorities were cottoning on to the fact that this had been an open <laughs> source supply, if you like, uh, for what was going on in Ireland. You know, your own your own munitions were returned back on you in, in, in many respects. So, you know, we, we played to our strengths, but there were foundries all over. Um, definitely, I know of one in Thomas Street. That that was key. Um, I suppose, if you like, we always have a bit of revolution in the Thomas Street area. It was nothing new. Um, but definitely, Inchicore was hugely important and it was stored all over the area it wasn't kept in the works so you have a variety of safe houses arms dumps i know there was one at rialto there's another one in rd street but i mean you, there's a whole chunk of work to be done mapping all these things from all the witness statements and um i'm only scratching the surface myself so if anybody wants to <laughs> take on the mission go ahead and <laughs> we'll find out where they all were you know i suppose um, Kathy, just we have to give a special mention because um a, a woman and um, that we both know um who was mentioned by the the the, the fourth battalion members and who had the sort of unique position of being an honorary member mm. of the, the fourth battalion is nelly bushel who's held yeah was just down the road from Inchicore Works and, and she was vital to the storing of the ammunition and the, the yeah. uh, 
the equipment. Um, Cathy, that sort of ties in nicely to uh, a comment from Tola. Hi, Tola. Um, and he, he said that uh, that this attack on the Ballyferma train um, it's, it's a fascinating example of incendiary warfare and this is what myself and me all be saying in the aftermath of Born of the Custom House um, the use um, of burning fabric which was thrown by Joe McGuinness and petrols uh, thrown uh, by separately by another volunteer to set the roof um, of the carriage on fire, presages the use of the incendiary by the IRA in, in later conflicts and then Told again, he's come across lots of examples um, of uh, preparation for attacks on railways, um, and it really took a battering. They really took a battering in the Civil War, possibly as a result of techniques in development at this time. Um, yeah. um, and we do see that in the Civil War, and Intercore Works has a role to play in that because the armor trains then that were used by the National Army were were. Made. Made, made there yeah exactly exactly uh, uh, it's it's absolutely fascinating i would have loved if we hadn't had the lockdown <laughs> in the preparation of this whole thing can you imagine the fun i'd have had in the railway archives themselves and <laughs> um, uh, you know we were limited with what we could call on um, over the last year or so, because so many of the places have been shut. But certainly every single aspect of it could be unpicked and teased. And there's a big question mark as well as to whether there were military casualties in this event. Um, it seems that a lot of it may have been conveniently pushed under the carpet because it didn't suit the narrative, because the narrative now was one of peace. That afternoon, everything stops. So the last action, we know the train is badly damaged. In fact, it continues on to Clondalkin and, and pulls in to discharge the, the most seriously injured. But it is eventually left in a siding in the Curra. And I know, I think it is, Harry O'Connor mentions that he sees that train and it's completely destroyed. So, um, you know, it, 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 the, there's a big, big question mark over whether or not there are British casualties. They're mentioned as British casualties in the witness statements, but it has never been mentioned on the other side. So that might be just one of those things that fell through the cracks because of the, the day that was in it and the, that weekend was the end of everything. So there's a lot more, I think, to the story to be unpicked in time and it will come out eventually. And that's, sorry, dear Brett, I was actually going to ask a question relating to that, that the mm. British um, sort of didn't always admit their, their casualties. Um, yes. And yes. we've talked about this, Cathy, especially with being mm. so close to truth, the bad publicity that this could, um, you know, receive, in, especially in England, not in Ireland, but in England, mm. with them negotiating yeah. with these terrorists or, you know, according to them, that are, you know, doing, committing these acts. So don't sort of um, give the actual real details of how many were attacked. I, I, I would, I'd say that's absolutely true, Liz. I have no doubt because it, there was too much fire, too much, you know, this was a um, spontaneous attack on the train from the train's point of view, if you like. Uh, and there's far too much um, firepower, and I'm using fire, you know, uh, as in, you know, light sacks on a roof of a train and, and you know, there's no casualties. So, like, it just doesn't, it doesn't really uh, add up. So there's, there's, again, that's something that needs to be dug into. And I, I think you've got it in one. It wouldn't have sat well um, if you, you played up your military casualties and, and with one hand and then on the other hand, you're negotiating with these same guys who, who are committing these uh, atrocities uh, in, in the light of uh, the way it would be reported elsewhere. Okay, and um, Michal, you may not get a word in here because the the conference <laughs> Sorry, they're just all flooding. Yeah. Um, Listen, okay. I used to have a copy with you. I know that. <laughs> it's not my fault. Um, and, and again, um, because it has been raised, uh, Cathy the Thompson submachine gun, um, and <laughs> there's probably a, a, I think Dermot is maybe fishing for you to do a talk on this, but the Thompson was first used in the drum Condra train, and which uh -huh. uh, and Dermot would love a, a talk to know more about, um, or a talk to be done on that ambush, but that's not Cathy's uh, size. Yeah, not my area. <laughs> 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 I, 
Oh God, like people, oh, we've got Kieran and, um, and Christina tuning in from America. Fantastic oh. talk. I'm just going to just go through um, Tomas McConmara. Hey, Tomas, um, great illustration of how Bally Fair was such a different place back in 1921 and how the echoes of those times have gone in the area. And that is one thing I can always say about Cathy. She will put you there and she will describe by detail, every little detail of what the vicinity was like. Um, Tom Loftus, very informative. Thanks, Cathy. Uh, Willie Doyle Dawn, thank you uh, again, Tomas. Great detail, Cathy. Enjoying this. Margaret Walsh in West Clare, um, tune in every week. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Claire Watson. Fascinating talk. Thank you, uh, Kieran McMullen. Great talk, Jerry McCarthy. Jerry, thank you so much. Uh. And a big, big hello and well done from Jerry. Uh, Karina Walsh. Hey, Karina, again, great talk, Cathy. And, and Cathy, you would know this, and Hall, you would know this, and we have to do a plug on this book that is impossible mm -hmm. to get. But um, Sleep, Soldier, Sleep by Jeremy yeah, O'Connor. Yeah. He has done so Absolutely. much to tell the story of the 4th it's Battalion. Needs, it it mm -hmm. badly needs to be reprinted. Mm -hmm. Republic. Yeah, it definitely does. If anyone, I think, is it available in the libraries? Um, I'm not it, sure. It, it is, but it's a bit of a battle too. <laughs> it was used to put on. Uh, it's it's hugely in demand, hugely in demand. And so the best way of, uh, I suppose, accessing that book is make friends with someone who has it. <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting mine. <laughs> it's, it's like healthy. You, you will not get that book. Uh, <laughs> They'll probably stand over you while you read it. Yes, <laughs> yeah, like a reference library. Yeah. You know, you won't be let, <laughs> now, it won't be let out of anyone's sight, but absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's almost like an untold story, though. They, I mean, yeah. the 4th Battalion is much more important to the story than, I. Well, in my opinion, and maybe I am a bit partisan, but in my opinion, I feel that they're, um, they're not given credit for, you know? Um, that, uh, and it's only when you start really digging into these individual incidents that you start to uh, really discover what is going on, you know, and uh, that's why every one of them, every single incident deserves to be forensically examined. And the only way we can do that is by looking at what's published, look at the newspapers, find the witness statements, look at the pension files and try and piece it all together. And you get contradictions all the time. So then you have to make a calculated or educated guess as to what are the facts and if you can't do that present all the information you've got that's what i tried to do tonight um you know but this was just one incident on a bridge in rural bally but it's hugely important because the book ends salahed break and brings us back to the end of the war of independence so it's sort of everything that happened in between are, are, are predated on these two incidents, uh, Sullahead Beg and Bally Firms. And you've clarified exactly which bridge it is, because everyone thinks it's the Kyle Moore Bridge. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> the Kyle Moore Bridge didn't exist. It didn't exist at the time. It wasn't there. The only bridge you could get over was the, um, so, so when, it's like everything else. I always say history hides in plain sight. So, once you know that the Kylemore Bridge over the canal and the Kylemore Bridge over the railway are new, you suddenly see that they're new. Now, when I say new, they're built as Ballyfermot is being built, the suburb is being built. But the bridge in question is the one out at Killeen, the one very near uh, the Lawns Park. Um, and that was to link the bridge there and the bridge over the canal was to link you to the mills in Clondalk and the Killeen Mills and the mills in Bluebell. So they're all part of the Camac network of industry, if you like. And that's how we have the industrial estates all around there. Um, they evolved. Uh, you know, it was a natural progression that when we left water power, we had electric power, but the industry was still there. So it was kind of a natural progression from one to the other. But um, no, it's the bridge at Killeen. Let's <laughs> be really clear on this one. That bridge is the one we're talking about. It is not any other bridge at all. It's, it's that one. <laughs> so if you go out and have a look at it, you can see, you can actually make out the old granite or limestone in the original line of the bridge is there and they have since put concrete blocks on top of that 
So you'll all be out now having a look at the bridge and you'll see what I see. And just as an aside, uh, because I've been working with all the communities um, and with community development, there are plans to mark this incident in the summer. And as a consequence of that, the bridge is going to be given a little bit of attention. So they're going to improve the appearance of the bridge in some way or other. And I think that's nice. They're, they're the um, consequences, if you like, the benefits of highlighting a story that it'll actually get a little bit of attention that otherwise it wouldn't have got. And it, certainly it has moved up um, in importance as being a significant site as part of our revolutionary history. So I, I kind of like that side of it as well, because I, you know, it's like everything else. If you don't tell the story, it gets forgotten. If you don't forensically dig into it, it's significant may not be uh, as obvious as it actually should be. And I hope this will help even heighten local awareness of how important it is um, in the story of Ireland. But yet it's a local story for the people in, in, who live in that part of Dublin. Brilliant, Cathy. And uh, again, just some, some comments and questions coming in. Uh, so, Patrick Kilfeder. Hey, Patrick. Patrick is with us every week. Um, thank you, Cathy. Uh, you made me feel I was there and knew the people and the place. You set the scene in the background so well, which you did. And most importantly, you described what the entirety of the community coming together as one in, in fighting the enemy. Um, and then uh, Tola again mentioned this one, and because we've talked about this, Cathy, um, the another ambush was planned for Crumlin Cross later the following yeah. day, and um, was called off. Uh, it was to have involved use of forty pound mines, uh, railway mines, as well as Thompson again. Yeah, uh, mentioned several statements. Great talk, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> Call and it. actually, that, that Crumlin Cross would have been, um, just to set the scene for people for that one, that would have been exactly where um, the Star Cinema used to be, you know, where the Star Bingo is held now, or Our Lady's Hospital, just on the road there, because the road widened out um, at that point. One piece taking me into Crumlin Village and the other piece taking me out to Baldonnell. Again, it's... Uh, upsetting the infrastructure that was connected with the building of Baldonnell because Baldonnell was becoming a significantly important barracks outside of Dublin and they would bring the workers out there daily under military escort and it would be just targets you know and every time something went by something happened and and funnily as well the, the because just showing you that the regiments that they brought in the British regiments they would start singing songs from the Western Front as we we're going up the Crumlin Road on the military transport. If you, you know, if you weren't planning on making yourself a target, why not sing a song and let them know you're on your way, you know, because these were the things they were actually doing, you know, um, singing in the trucks as they were going out to Baldon and then the lads were waiting for them as they got a very stretches along what we know today as the Drimna Road or the Crumlin Road. Um, and of course, the Halfway House is another incident that took place at the burning of the pub there. Um, but that's a story for a whole other night. Uh, <laughs> there's a long story. <laughs> <Yeah. too. laughs> the anniversary, that was actually the 5th of May, uh, where, yeah. where yeah. you have been working with a local... Uh, I have, yeah, yeah. So Me. what's the space there is yeah. going to happen about the halfway house attack? Yeah, yeah. It's We've missed the anniversary because of the pandemic, but we haven't missed the commemorating the event, and we will find a way of doing it. We definitely will. Okay, and there's still some more uh, coming in. Uh, so, uh, oh, oh God, um, hang on. Um, oh, from Mark. Hi, Mark. And um, just like to say, happy birthday to Mark's dad, Mark O'Brien's dad. He's 95, so happy birthday, Mr. O'Brien. Um, and Mark just asked, where in Crumlin was the RIC barracks, Cathy? Oh, good question. Okay, so anyone who's familiar with Crumlin Village, um, I set the scene again, the, the Star Cinema or Our Lady's Crumlin. So you, you take the route from Our Lady's Hospital into the village. So you're coming up what they call today St. Mary's Road. And then at the end of St. Mary's Road, you turn left into the village and straight ahead of you is present day Bunting Road. Right where St. Mary's Road ends and Bunting Road begins. Imagine Bunting Road's not there. It's, uh, you know, a much more recent addition to the area. 
that's where the RIC barracks was in Crumlin. Right, right as you came, just before you hit the village itself, the first thing you met, St. Mary's, the old church on your left hand side, and the RIC barracks right in front of you at, at that point. And of course, it's destroyed by fire, <laughs> by you know who. And uh, <laughs> again, that's a whole other story. Um, but it, 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 what I was trying to highlight was you know, these local incidents were happening. Imagine the tension in the community at the time and how freely they moved. Um, it'd be kind of difficult for us today to get from Crumlin across to Inchicor. We'd have to kind of go the long way around and follow the main roads. In their time, 100 years ago, it was used in country lanes and across fields. And, you know, there were, there were routes that could be used and they're kind of lost in our landscape today. So, you, you, you know, you sort of have to go back in time, look at the old maps and kind of work it out. So floods place on the floods would be roughly where McDonald's is today in Ballyfermot. Um, their farm was all around there and um, they were key to the revolution as well. They're the safe house. So um, I'm very, very well known and freely admitted as such as well. And again, just a few more. Um, and I, my apologies. Aoife Niaxin I'm sorry, Aoife. Aoife um, did say, <laughs> thank you, Cathy. Fantastic detail. Um, Cathy, just amazing. Claire, uh, what's some fascinating talk. Um, there is another question here um, about, sorry, Michal, do you want to hop in there, Michal, while I scroll? Because I'm trying to look at the <laughs> sure. tablet and phone. They're coming in at yeah. different points. <laughs> I was just going to make the comment that when you talked about that attack on the um, police patrol, the, the cycle patrol, there were five, five of them, and they were actually coming, for, they, they were on patrol from Lucan, uh, well, what would now be the Garda station, the RIC station there. There was a big fuss made of that later because um, most of the men were actually Catholics, uh, two of them were early speakers, and um, there was a big, a big attempt to raise some sympathy for them uh, locally, but it didn't get very far, I think. Mm -hmm. um, as things were, they were seen for what you know for what they were and for the organisation they represented. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I am just scrolling yeah. down because yeah, sure. uh, I just want to make sure I'm getting them all because yeah. there's there's something about the Thompson. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm going to just. Well, I know Frank has a comment up on it. But they were yes. still in use later in '69. <laughs> yes, Frank, they were still the Thompson were still in use in Belfast in '69. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Again, a, an issue for another night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, 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 yes, you get mm. completely out of that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, a particularly yeah. iconic weapon. Um, mm. But at, at this stage, it, it, it was a problem, problematic weapon. Where at the time of the ambush, the the, the bridge attack, it was, they still hadn't got quite got to grips with it. Yeah. But the huge problem, of course, with that more e more so even than a handgun. Was 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 lack lack of ammunition first? Yeah, it used so much ammunition. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you fire off, you know, as much ammunition as you could get in a couple of minutes, it'll be gone. I mean, the drum held a hundred bullets, and uh, it'll be gone in no time if you're working careful. So it's a very difficult weapon to control. It tended to to move upwards as you fired it. Uh, so you know, aiming it at anything other than something like a train, where you know accuracy wasn't that important, you could do it. Mm. I, suppose, I suppose too from the British point of view it marks an escalation in the, mm. the ability of the IRA as well oh. you know all of these things are significant in what happens next uh, they are pushes towards the, the, the truce I mean taking on a train full of like, with the 70 to 100 soldiers horses yeah. civilians and this yeah. was free target, you know, um, and, a, and a machine gun being used in the process as well. That, that, that changes things completely. This isn't just blowing up a, a piece of a road and, and, and a little checkpoint or anything like that. Yeah. This is hugely different, you know. Um, no, it is. I mean, it comes back indeed to the Custom House. I mean, what De Valera had wanted there. He wanted mm. war, not, not, not skirmishes. He wanted war, not, not like guerrilla tactics. He wanted yeah. uh, things that would make the news. Uh, from a PR point of view that the British would find very hard to put down as, as just a sort of murder here and murder there. Mm. Um, 
and this is what he wants. The things we get around the world as, as big stories. Yeah. And this, this one indeed mm -hmm. did it traveled it traveled again, like mm -hmm. all of them. But as you say, with the with the truce, there was a tendency to play it down. Yeah. Uh, as much yeah. as possible. And probably the, the, the casualties as well for for that reason. Mm -hmm. Um but at so, some stage hopefully we we we'll get the full figures on it and know who how many were, were hurt or, or killed in it. Yeah. They lost yeah. them out of it. Mm -hmm. And just to come back in, just on that, mm -hmm. Dermot O'Connor tunes in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and <laughs> he says, Porrick, um, got the list of casualties off the medical corps in the Curra. So yeah. it, there had to be more damage. As, as Porrick yeah. explains it, the damage that was done. Um, thanks, Dermot. And Aoife again, um, my great-grandfather works in Intercore Works. Is there any way to find out uh, who from the works was involved in the activity? <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great yeah. question, and um, yeah, yeah I, I don't blame don't blame her for being curious. Uh, I'm curious myself. Um, I, I don't. I think it's going to be the usual scrabble around, looking at what's been written. Not everybody left a witness statement. That's the yeah. other issue. Um, so, but the pension yeah. files are very telling. Um, the, the, the pension files have been a bit of a revelation because you, mm. you get accounts, say, from parents or from, um, you know, uh, spouses uh, in them, which have been quite interesting to look at. I know a couple of the other incidents that I was looking at as well, a whole new complexion was put on the story by looking at the family ones. So I would just suggest that, you know, Irish records have turned us on. turn up someday and um, we'll be able to put it yeah. together but it's a fantastic question um, and yeah. I'm not sure about the railway records because genuinely I haven't seen them um, but I'm, I'm, I, I would pass that on to somebody else who might know more about yeah. it. Michal have you any ideas? No, I, I, just, I was just going to say that from what I've seen in terms of the witness statements and that it seems like uh, the railway works with little bit like Guinness's you know, if your father worked there, you could get a job there. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if you find one member of a family there, uh, have a look for another one. You'll probably find them in there younger as they go down. <laughs> um, I mean, I came across a guy the other day, buried here in a, a local graveyard. And, um, you know, he, he was a, uh, an Arden Turner, but he ended up getting a job in uh, Inchicore Railway Works because his father worked there. Uh, and then he he was one of these who was ma who ended up making making grenades etc there as well got involved with that um, and you know railway uh, engine drivers as well so yes. that seemed to get you a job in Intercore Railway Works as well mm. looked mm -hmm. like you could do that so yes there's a, a lot of them there um, I mean again um, later on in the year we'll be publishing a book by James Langton on the graveyard here uh, in Esker graveyard in Lucan. And there's probably four or five of the people in that were working in uh, Intercore Railway Works at some stage um, as a side to their uh, more, mil more militant operations. Um, so look out for that. We'll get a couple of names out of that anyway. And there'll be links on for the name source as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, just a few more comments are still coming in, Cathy. Um, just uh, talking about the halfway house Ambush and Michael Sweeney, um, with this from Johnny yeah. Doyle, Michael Sweeney um, was wounded at the Half House ambush and his mother's house at number five, Harold's Cross, was still an arms drop after the Civil War. Um, and after the war, John Joe O'Brien moved from Galbally Limerick to Kilmainham and owned the Glen of Arhalo pub. And there's a fantastic oh. book about uh, John Joe O'Brien written by his son. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, you can get it, and, and that's fantastic. Everyone, you're going to leave a reading list. Um, <laughs> um, and again, Tomas, uh, brilliant stuff, Cathy, again. Um, and uh, dear Mid Bretnock, uh, worth mentioning that Inchcore area also contributes to at least three volunteers to the international brigades. Um, a plaque was erected there a few years ago. I think some of them uh, worked in the Inchcore works also. So you still have that revolutionary um, uh, tendency where there's wrongs being, you know, committed that they went off abroad. 
and, and mm. try to help. Um, and again, Aoife, thank you. Lots more reading to be done. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Mm. Yeah. As Cathy said at the start, like, you, we're only scratching the surface with this. We really mm. are, aren't we, Cathy? Yeah, very much so. And and in many, many respects, we, we really, we need to do this with every incident. You know, you need to really get that balance because some things have actually been lost. I mean, you know, I I would have connections up around the Walkinstown area and I say to people, oh, you know, the halfway house pub that was uh, um, mined during the War of Independence. And they look at you and say, no, it wasn't. You know, so like, these stories have been completely <laughs> yeah. lost. And yeah. then they get a history lesson. But, you know, that's all over the day. But, but, you know, every single one of those incidents will be really worth um, working through them. Who's involved? Where did yeah. they come from? Find out more about them. Um, and, and it's usually sparked off by some little thing. A little newspaper cutting, a little anecdotal story mentioned, whatever it might be. And then just keep layering it. Go back and use what you can find. Um, but there's, we're only beginning. <laughs> this is going to run and run. It definitely is, you know. And that's the value of doing talks like these because everybody's chipping in their perspective and that's what we need. We need so much more of that and we need to spark people's interest. Um, I know certainly a lot of my groups out around Ballyfermot have a completely different perspective now of that one incident and how much it means to them because it really means a lot to people when the national story is a local story that that's that changes everything it's not just something that happens off out there in the the big bad world it actually happened on your doorstep and um, then you get curious and you will find things you, you'll find them where in places I wouldn't even think of looking you know so um yeah, so I, I hope it does that good. That's my that's my aim and my ambition with these things is to get people curious. Oh, we certainly do that, Kathy. <laughs> and, uh, and something always yeah, sparks yeah. from one of your talks. Something yeah. always is, is begins as a result of one yeah. of your talks, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, and again, just more comments, Cathy, um, and questions. Um, Joseph Rain, uh, brilliant as usual. Your speakers are first class, and I would totally agree. Um, yeah. And just a question, and probably Michal, you might come in on this. Um, were the grenades for local use only or distribution throughout the country? Oh, good question. I'd imagine with, with the Prairie, they'd have to have their own mold, their own factories that they would make them locally. Mm. No, the grenades were 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 sent out. Uh, they were, um, Kieran McMullen actually touched on this. They were sent around the country, but they were filled in the country. Okay. Because oh. you couldn't send a live grenade. <laughs> you, know, it was, it was, you can imagine the problems that would happen there. I mean, you know, they, they weren't quite the safest things. But mm. uh, around, in Dublin, no problem. You'd use them lo locally where they were made. But you sent them out, go down the country. They would make their own uh, whatever to fill them with and fill them down there and that was it but they would be cast up here and sent away um, uh, brilliant Michal and um, yeah. just, you mentioned Kieran uh, Christina just yeah. Christina and Kieran are going to have some tour of Ireland when they come back <laughs> um, because Christina said excellent job explaining yeah. the wares in your talk Cathy especially for those of us who do not travel around except yeah. for twice a year so I think Ballyfermot will be on Kieran <laughs> and Christina <laughs> Bus trips out to the bridge, <laughs> or train trips out to the bridge, yeah. or to the point. Yeah. Duck. <laughs> and, 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 uh, Lindy, hey Lindy. Uh, oh, Lindy, great. Again, thanks, Kathy. Brilliant detail, Michael Doyle. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Kathy, you've just just the the, mm -hmm. the comments, and you'll be able to see them yourself. Um, yeah. it was absolutely fantastic um Kathy you did sort of touch on it in the talk um as in and, and again myself and me all and Laz will will sort of talk about yeah. this well that the to target the IRA began to target the infrastructure the supplies and what was it that we discovered that um the value of a horse was actually more than a soul yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was something like 120 pounds was the value of a donkey and um, the value of a soldier was probably something like a hundred pounds, yeah. you know, in, in, if they were doing a military calculation. Yeah. So this is where it changes that the, yes. um, the IRA realize that if they target equipment, 
um, materials, the, the horse, well, remember the horse is the key mode of transport. I mean, military lorries were probably flying around the place all right, but that's yeah. about it. We, we don't really have, we're not really in the era of the motor car as yeah, such um, at this yeah. stage. So yeah. by targeting things like that, they were getting as much, it was cost, it, it all came back to money. And so it was really, really costing the British so much money to maintain this campaign in Ireland that it was getting untenable because they were losing their equipment, their horsepower, their machinery, you know, destroying a train like that, you, they, yeah. whatever about the people getting out of it, you couldn't get the, the, the equipment out of it. So that's no, gone, no. that's written off. So, um, and, that, and that's just yeah. one, this is just one train under one bridge in Ballyfermot. Yeah. So consider all the other things that had been happening as well. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the value of a, I think the value of a donkey, I had that somewhere, I yeah. think it was uh, 120 pounds, I think yeah. was the value of a donkey or a yeah. horse. So, um, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, this, but this ties back, you're quite right, Cathy, this ties back to, again, uh, going back to the burning of the custom house, mm. you know, you destroy their ability to raise money. Yeah. You know, money means they can buy things, they can pay for things. But if you take the money away, they can't pay their soldiers. Mm. They cannot pay, cannot buy their donkeys. Uh, mm. They cannot buy the hay, another thing they burned later. Um, you know, so they, they, they were, in a sense, you know, soft targets, but easier targets. You didn't have to go after, you didn't have to kill men. You, you could destroy their ability to fight you. Yeah. And yeah, that was what they were doing yeah. with a lot of this. Mm -hmm. It all ties in every bit of it. Mm -hmm. you know, and, that's and what that, you need to see these things as, as a round. You um, know, not yeah, that's it. You have to look. Yeah. That's what I mean about looking at each thing forensically. Because yeah. you're absolutely right, Michal. There's a number of accounts in the you find um, you find them in the newspapers of people complaining about the fact that the hay was all being commandeered by the British yeah. military establishment in Dublin, yeah. and when they couldn't get enough in Dublin. They then uh, took the hay from Kildare, Mead, Loud, all, all the counties around Dublin, which yeah. meant you hadn't a chance of yes. feeding your own horses, um, yeah. you know, um, and this was the only, yeah. well, it was the main mode of transport. So yeah. it, it, even things as significant as that are hugely important. That interferes with your ability to work um, yeah. as a, a civilian. So you're going to be angry with the, military establishment yeah. and then of course yeah. the British military establishment is trying to keep its own uh, books balanced here in Dublin. It, it's a fascinating uh, topic yeah. and it's all and part it's of the war. Yeah. It's long term too, if you cannot mm. feed, feed your horses or your cattle, um, they're going to die and that yeah. means that next year you, you know, have nothing. Time, you have nothing like and that. if you have nothing, the government has nothing. You know, mm. It goes all the way down the line. So mm. yes, it was a, it was a, a simple way and in many ways to to disable what was what we were fighting yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, again sorry could you a few more um to, uh, <laughs> ken larkin uh and <laughs> ken, um and he said Liam kyo um rep uh, tells of his father who worked in the inch car works and was from the ranch and the ranch provides a lot of volunteers um, and coming on um, and is involved in both in the rise and the war of independence, which I hope would be printed this year. That would be amazing because amazing. as you've shown, Cathy, you cannot, and I suppose this is a thread that has been running through the series of talks, you cannot tell the national story without the local story. It's just I completely agree. Absolutely agree. I really do. And and I can see the light bulb moments. I can see, you know, I've, I've done so many talks like this. And when I mention something that people know, something that they're familiar with, and I can tie it into a bigger, more remote story that they, you know, probably vaguely heard of, it yeah. changes completely if you can bring it yeah. back to their own doorstep. And I, I, I completely agree. And I'm hugely grateful to Ken. It's been a joy working with Ken over the last few years mm -hmm. and the group out in Bally Fair with Sean and, and Suzanne and all the others. I mean, they're, they're just amazing what they're doing. They are gathering every aspect of the history, the social story of Ballyfermot and a community. It would be an amazing study for somebody to do how a community can build, survive and sustain itself by the records that Ken and his team out there have gathered over the years. It's, it's phenomenal. 
yeah. So a big thanks and delighted Ken was here tonight. Thank you, Ken. And thank you for those photographs, Ken. It would have been a very dry talk without them. <laughs> I'm really acknowledging all the help I got there, you know. <laughs> and of course, a big shout out to Jerry McCarthy. Who oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Again. Yeah. He was just being amazing, and and especially mm -hmm. with myself and Michal at the start of all of this. Uh, he's really totally. mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a yeah. Republican history fairy godmother. And Christina, Christina, um, from America, um, after not being able to come over in a year and a half, two missed book launches and another coming, uh, we will have to stay a month to catch up with everything. Yeah. You will. Uh, yeah. Um, and of course, Christina yeah. Sultan Kieran gave the talk on the weapons mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. the, the war, the uh, burning of the Custom House. Um, yeah. Sorry, Mia, I'll, I'll pass back over to yourself. Um, yeah. okay. like well, well there was just a message for Christina to remind her that uh, her Hop House 13 is safe here, they're only stopping it in England, <laughs> not here. <laughs> so she can have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kathy, can, can I ask you just because I know like both of us actually rely on them, but just in terms of how valuable the newspapers are to, to, yeah. to discovering these stories and what is not necessarily told in the witness statements or the pension files or something that may be mentioned very briefly in the witness mm -hmm. statements. Yeah. And then the new because like, I know you just the newspapers is your go to place. It is. It is my go-to place. So with the newspapers, what you've got to remember, we're so used to instant news now. Like, you know, we, we, we log on to Twitter, Facebook, whatever we're on, and we get the news the minute, almost before it happens, if you like. You know, it's so instantaneous. The first thing you do with the newspaper, check the date on the paper, because it, it is most likely a story written two or three days after the event so that's the first thing you've got to do because it's the we're so used to the instant world today when you're going back to those times it wasn't that instant you didn't have phone lines you know you you know random people had a phone number maybe with four digits in it that's that's all we had so um you, you know the movement of news was different some of it might be hearsay so it can it not necessarily a person on the spot giving a witness account. It might be the local gossip that makes its way into the papers. But we really are good at gossip in Ireland and we're never that far from the truth, you know? Yeah. That's another thing I've learned. So they're the key things you start with your newspaper. But remember too, your papers have a political bias. So when you look at them, um, always work out which paper you're looking at. So a really descriptive paper from the time is the Freeman's Journal. They write them like they're writing an essay for their history projects. You know, it, it, the, the detail is unbelievable. You'll be, you'll be told, how, you know, how many horses are on the cart and, you know, four hay ricks on the back and all this kind of, the detail is phenomenal. I mean, the style of writing is very descriptive. But then you might get other papers that have that other bias that are, well, it's the case today. I mean, it, you know, in, in many, we would know instinctively that some papers will have a slant that others don't. But that's what makes it all the better. If you put them all out in front of you, you are then getting the, the different accounts. So I love to start with a newspaper cutting, no matter how small. No matter, little headlines are the ones that really get me. And then I try and build the story behind that. And then you have your other sources. So your witness statements, again, don't forget, they can be written, what, maybe 20, 30, some cases nearly 40 years after the event. Um, so bear in mind that bias as well, that type of... Um, you know what what for, what sort of memory is it you know is it uh, is it absolutely reliable so you've got to balance all of them together so that's why i presented it the way it did um we're looking at the different newspaper accounts we were looking at different witness statements we're looking at different uh, the way different things are reported the other thing and i'm discovering this more and more the regional newspapers are amazing for finding things that happened in Dublin and um, that didn't necessarily uh, 
<laughs> make it into the, the standard press in Dublin. And you find all sorts of, of, of weird and wonderful things in the regional papers. And I think in some cases it's because Dublin had this rural hinter hinterland. So it had more of connections with the rural communities than it necessarily had with the city. So I think you get that lovely clash of rural, urban, so uh, don't just stick with your traditional Irish Times Independent, Freemans Journal, whatever it might be. Go elsewhere and see what you can find in the other ones as well. And I, I know we both have found little gems in the, in the rural papers. So uh, um, well, well worth having a look at. Well worth having a look at. But then I go to census records. Um, it, it's kind of my standard now, you know, that just, okay, it's, it's 10 years out at this stage, like if we're looking at 1921, the most recent census we have available to us is 1911. But what it does show you is these communities didn't move around all that much. And if they did move, they literally moved from number one into number four or you know, two roads away. They stayed in their communities. And I think it's what Michal was mentioning there as well, the workplace, um, you know, you worked in the Inchicore Works, you're not going to put a big commute on yourself, you know, because uh, you can't, it's not, it's not available, uh, the trains aren't safe, we can see that, um, but you, but you know what I mean, uh, um, you, you, you lived near where you worked, um, and if you got a job, it was inevitably maybe a place where, like, your father had worked in, or it was your job for life. So it, 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 it's to, you don't really understand the whole story unless you put yourself in the moment and work out what's going on. So word of caution with the papers, look at the date it's publishing and don't stop there because you will find more information um, in the subsequent weeks. Um, we had it with the Brunswick Street um, incident where we actually found a missing casualty because she died about a month later. Um, and, and ironically, it was a woman that was left out. So, um, you know, so keep going, you know, um, keep going and go ahead and remember the times you're dealing with. So they'd be my little pieces, but definitely my newspapers. I usually start there and work backwards. <laughs> so see how I get on. And and we always sort of do a plug um, with each talk. Uh, Irish newspaper archives, if anyone hasn't, like it is available when the in the libraries when they are open for free. But um, at the moment, Irish newspaper archives we're doing a discount code, mm -hmm. um, and it is a great resource. It's a fantastic resource. So if anyone um, you know, wants to have have a, a treat yourself to something but it's addictive as well like you oh, yeah. 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 Read yeah. The papers um Kathy, a few more to, uh, questions and comments um uh, Johnny Doyle uh McCullough was the man taken hay etc during World War one based at the Royal Hospital in Kamenum uh, Lusk was a remount center RDS was a loading point for horses on the western front wow. it's fantastic the little bits of information mm. that come in from everyone like it, it's it's yeah. absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, we have, uh, uh, and this is this comment from Christina and Aoife again, and, and thank mm. you everyone so, so much. But uh, thank you all for these wonderful talks. The only good thing that's come out of lockdown. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, myself and me, all I think, yeah. are, we're living for the 25th of May. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Aoife uh, couldn't agree more. And I have to say, and I, I think Michal agrees with me here, like the, yeah. the we knew we had a, a, a great, uh, uh, you know, cache of guest speakers um, mm -hmm. and we knew they wouldn't disappoint and we were yeah. just so delighted that we were able to learn how to use Zoom to share <laughs> these talks with yeah. you um, because we certainly wouldn't have had this reach if we were doing the conference on the day um, yeah. you know, it's, so it's, it has been wonderful mm -hmm. um, and yeah. thank you all really for tuning in every week because you know yeah. you are helping to to spread the word and these stories mm. mm -hmm. I'll, I'll yeah. hand over to you Michal. i'm going to do one more scan yeah I'll... okay have another look um yeah I, i'm just, just going back to what you were saying kathy about sources um don't rule out sort of family stories yes that's, there's usually that's, a yeah. gem in there they're probably not true 
but there's a gem in there somewhere. Yeah, which yeah. when you get to it, a little nugget there that is, it's based on truth. Family stories are really based on, on falsehood. Mm. Because you'll be a little bit of truth in them somewhere and you'll find it, you'll find it. It's, it's another, absolutely nothing to do with this, but I thought you're talking about hay and um, <laughs> collected in, in, in collect, Kilmainham, just being collected in Kilmainham. Uh, it's a story I think I mentioned to you before and I never gave you the information on, but George Dunn, the go governor of Kilmainham, was done for stealing hay from Kilmainham, was accused of stealing it. Uh, they used it as bedding for the prisoners. And he was taking it out to Ballyfermot, to his farm out there, for his animals. They used hay from the, from, from the cells. <laughs> and he, he was caught over that in later life. So there's a reverse situation going on there. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. You know, 100 yeah. years earlier. Yeah. The, the value of hay <laughs> takes on a whole new meaning, you know? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Fascinating. It all goes there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you will find these. Um, uh, I mean, the, the newspapers are, are absolutely fabulous, but also if you can get to look, the foreign papers. Mm. You, get to, you know, uh, there's, every now and then you find the, the, the uh, foreign archives, the particular American ones. But you go to um, Australia where you can get onto them for free down there. Um, uh, what's a trove, isn't it, the one down there? Um, but you can get onto their papers for free and you will find early stories there because there's such a huge Irish community in these places mm. that they carry Irish stories and they'll often carry them in depth. They carry interviews with people. They'll carry life stories down in, in, in their papers down there. So they're, they're, they're well worth looking at as well. It, you know, it's not just in, in Dublin or just in Ireland or wherever your event happened. Look around the world for it as well. And, uh, you know, it just means you never stop looking. I know. <laughs> 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 That's the problem. That is the problem. Very you know, much so. And, and I mean, you can end up enjoying the journey too much, I think. Mm. Oh, God. Yes, <laughs> yes. We, yeah. we would be testament to that. <laughs> yes, we, we, know we, that. Certainly, yeah. we can certainly agree to that. And yeah. um, I, oh, I'm just going through yeah, yeah. again. Right. There is, and just sort of following on from that newspapers, uh, the, 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 in relation to the newspapers. Um, and it is quite true, Johnny Doyle says, the papers often carry erroneous stories that are comedy gold. And again, yeah. we'd be <laughs> testified to that. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Um, for example, yeah. Austrians captured during the Easter Rising, Sinn Féin airplanes in the west of Ireland, Renault <laughs> Frank being smuggled into Ireland from Russia. <laughs> so yeah. fake news was, was alive and well all the way back then. I'm going to give one more... Yeah. One more scroll, but um, Kathy again a resounding success as yeah. I knew it would be. But I suppose, and it because probably people were thinking as well, why were we doing a talk on an event that happened six weeks after, after. the morning of the custom house? Mm -hmm. Um, and it does actually tie in, but t tonight's yeah. date was significant because it is the 8th of May. The event happened on the 8th of July, and we thought that this would be a nice way to mark it. In, in mm -hmm. some, this might be something that is missed, Cathy, in yeah. the scenery um, mm -hmm. yeah. of the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, and I would agree there. And I, I will do anything to promote the area. <laughs> That I'm working in. I, I really mean that, and I and it was a thing. It was a decision I made very early on, and um, because my whole plan was to find the big stories and bring them back to the areas they belong in, and I think you get a whole different perspective of the truth if you look at it from the Ballyfermot perspective. You know, if you if you put it from the way that was the last significant event, and all all the things that were cancelled after that because of the big machinery that was working away between Dublin and London. Yeah. And, you know, they're the key things. It's, you know, history could be heavy going if you don't really look oh, at yeah. the other things that were going on behind it. And yeah. I, I do think it's a significant, the, the power, the, uh, the, the daring of the IRA is the, the confidence of them. Yeah. is growing constantly, even though with all the issues that are going on in ammunition, whatever might, else was happening. And this obviously is a turning, uh, is something that twists it around and bring, mm -hmm. brings it back to um, the mm -hmm. truce. Because if, if the truce didn't happen, the alternative was full military um, yeah. invasion of Ireland, really. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the consequences of that would have been absolutely horrendous. Uh, it would have been a, a war, a complete war, 
speaking out on yeah. this island. Um, so it just took brave people in many respects to stand yeah. back and say, hang on a minute, it's yeah. enough is enough, you know. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it, 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 it's brilliant if you can bring it into a story. <laughs> And it happened to be in Ballyfermot. Thank you. <laughs> the gods are working on my side, I can say, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah. yeah, so I'm delighted to be able to kind of have something as significant as that and make yeah. it as part of the, the bigger story as well. Right. I, I, I think is one of the things that the story shows is that the IRA was a learning army. Yes, yes. that's exactly right. It, yeah. it learned from yeah. what had happened. It learned from the material that it had and it could use. Uh, mm. You know, we don't have guns, what do we do? We throw a, a, a patch of salt rag onto it, onto yeah. a train top and set fire to it. Uh, you know, this sort of thing. Um, you know, we'll, we'll burn their lorries, we'll burn their hay, we'll, you know, we'll use mm. fire easy enough to do. Um, as opposed to having stand-up fights, with, whereas the British Army were coming in and was still thinking. They had their generals who'd come out of the First mm. World War and they were thinking conventional fights and they were trying to adapt and they were struggling trying to do that. Mm. And this is why we saw the black and tans and the uh, auxiliaries come in, of course, um, you know, but they couldn't be controlled. So, so you had an uncontrollable army and an overly controlled army against a learning army. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was just an incredible thing. To, you know, if, if you can stand back and be, be objective about it, just yeah. to watch how that developed is actually, actually incredible. Mm. And when you look at the numbers involved on both sides, you know, uh, no, I, I think this with the custom house and all the things that followed uh, showed, and, and indeed going back to Easter the previous year when they started burning tax offices and RAC off, uh, uh, the, 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 um, barracks, etc. Just that they were learning all the time, adapting, mm -hmm. changing, and it made it very, very difficult to fight an army like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Constantly changing his tactics. And also if you've lost the people, Michal, you know, you lost... Yeah. And um, the the Ireland yeah. which it started to really galvanise with the anti construction mm. one, which Liz has covered so well in the past, um, and yeah. that, that united people who would never be united in a fit. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like people were talking to people who would never be yeah. connected. But so yeah. that was the beginning, I, you know. So this, yeah. if you take the whole thing in the round. Um, yeah. You can actually track the change in the mood from 1913 right through yeah. 1916, right through to yeah. this particular time. And when you've lost the local mood, yeah. you've yeah. lost the war. You've completely yes. lost the war. Absolutely. Um, and and I, somebody spotted that eventually. And, and they could yeah. see the daring do. Yeah. They, they were just going to keep bringing the fight to the enemy. They didn't. Yeah. They, they, they were fearless in that respect. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I am just scanning uh, down through again because the comments are still coming in. Um, again, great talk. Um, well done. Fascinating talk. Um, again, just uh, mm -hmm. just absolutely. Uh, is, <laughs> yeah, it's just praise for you, Cathy, which is totally well deserved. Um, and and again, and there's lovely com comments coming in for to ourselves, Michal, for organising this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're yeah. we're on a roll leading up to the 25th. Yeah. We've been planning this for 12 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we didn't think we'd yeah, have yeah, to yeah. We so, we make haste slowly. <laughs> well, in a way, so, so we've been learning as well. We've been practicing yeah. every year with our conferences, and they've been getting better. <laughs> and I'm so delighted, Cathy. Yeah. This, this is the first week in a long time that uh, we've had no hiccups, really. You know. So, oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh God, Cathy, we've had you nearly on for two hours. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to do one more quick scan, Cathy. Yeah. But yeah. is there okay. any um, events? Because I know you've been extremely busy with the story in residence, doing a lot of online talks. Um, is there any that are coming up in the coming weeks that you want to give a plug to, um, or anyone you want to give a shout out to? Um, well, I, I've, I've been doing it. The, the, the trouble with the lockdown is every time we did a talk. The next thing is I get a message and say, oh, I missed it. When are you doing it again? Yeah. <laughs> so for anybody who missed the puddle talk, for the final time, I hope, for a while, because I actually know the river intimately at this stage, um, I am doing it for the Harris Cross Festival on Monday night at 8 o'clock. 
And um, so if anybody wants to uh, tune in for that one, I'm sure they'd be delighted uh, to get good numbers. Because again, like all the local festivals, they've had to go online uh, and we will be doing things online for the foreseeable future as well. Uh, another thing that I'm doing, um, I've been doing this during the lockdown, talk, talk about finding religion. Um, I've been doing the parish <laughs> webcams um, because if yeah. you think about it, the infrastructure is there. And you, I just rock up and do a talk. So I'm on the Drimna Parish webcam on Tuesday. Um, and we're just going to do um, a, a talk just generally about Drimna, uh, the Drimna area. So it's been beautiful for people who have been housebound during um, the pandemic. Um, a lot of people like to tune in, say, for the morning mass. And they just leave the webcam on. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I appear on the screen <laughs> doing, doing something. Yeah. And uh, the parishes have been noting that their numbers are going up when I'm on. <laughs> so uh, I don't know whether I've been used for another, <laughs> another mission or not. Um, and then one other little thing that we are doing, and this is quite a nice little thing. I'll just let the, um, the audience here tonight in on a, a, a project that we're working on. We've been getting children involved in writing down their memories of COVID. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a number of schools that I've been working with and we're encouraging the children to create their own primary source. And it's just an A4 page, something of their memory of COVID, whether they decide to write a story, a poem, a song, or draw a picture. We really don't mind what they do. And I got agreement then with the City Archive to accept these and bring them into the city archive. And we had to manage it okay. a particular way for child protection. But yeah. said all of that, um, my ambition is that the children will make their way to the archive to find mm -hmm. their record. Um, mm -hmm. So you get a full meaning of what an archive is, what a primary source is, and you're only in fifth class. So, um, yeah. uh, and I've done that now with nine schools um, so far. Um, just I turn up on Zoom in the classroom and they get to ask the historian various questions. Um, key questions have been, what's the difference between archaeology and an archive? I won't tell you the way archaeology was pronounced, but you got the general idea. <laughs> um, so, so they're little things that I've been involved with yeah. doing. But what I'm hoping is there are upcoming historians in the next generations. And this might be the beginning of just understanding the difference between a primary source, a secondary source, how you create one and what an archive is and how it works. So little things like that, they might not sound like much, but to me they're big projects and um, I think they're important and um, just might make history a bit more fun and yeah. you make it wow. fun, it might have a knock-on effect for English, for your way you would debate, the way you question um, and I must say the children of our area are amazing. They have no inhibitions. They have no problems asking the historian <laughs> anything. <laughs> so it's just great to see them with that confidence um, yeah. at that age. And it's, it's just a joy to work with. So that's the other little project that we have. We're hoping it will turn into a children's archive held in the city archive. So um, that again would be very useful for anyone studying childcare, studying to work yeah. with children, but also for the children's perspective of things as well, which often gets lost in yeah. the story yeah. industry. So, yeah. yeah so oh, that's as, as we've discovered, Cathy, that the children's story is so important to. Oh, yeah, it's huge. Huge. Yeah. 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 Overlook them. Um, there's just a few more questions. Um, Dearmond, um, is there a poster or event for the Puddle Talk? Uh, Dearmond wants to publish it um, on shared. Oh. Sites yeah. and Mark Jenkins. Hey, Mark, you came. Thanks, in. Mark. Um, yeah. And thanks, Mark. I know you're busy. Um, if you look up Harold's Cross uh, Festival page, so, the details will be there. So, everyone, Harold's Cross Festival page, and um, the details of Kathy's talk will be there. Yeah. Um, and these are probably out of sync, these questions. Um, but uh, uh, Dermot said something about house to house fighting in cities. Uh, oh, that's obviously from yeah, the fake news. Um, yeah, house to house fighting in cities, as the deal as in Puerto Rico, I think, yeah. and the Russians in Petrograd. And Mark Jenkins, uh, you must check out the Australian newspapers. Thanks, Michal. I'm obsessed <laughs> with the archives. <laughs> <laughs> we know that, Mark. And Mark Jenkins, uh, if anyone, um, really, if you don't follow this page, you should. Um, old oh, Ireland oh. and Cathy Olden. What's, what's Mark's page? Old Ireland. Uh, uh, Old Ireland, isn't it? 
and yeah, 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 yeah. I'll look it up. Um, but Mark's page is fantastic. fantastic. If, you don't, yeah. Um, yeah. if you haven't started following that, and I'm going to look that up just before we, we do go. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to type in here and multitasking now. Old <laughs> and new photos. Just let me double check. Okay. Have you got it there, Michal? Uh, no, I don't have them here, no. Okay. Um, I am connected. Oh. I am following it all right, but uh, yeah. I will look that up um, just yeah. before we finish. Um, or Mark, if you're on here, put up the name of your, your Facebook yeah. page. Um, Easy, yeah. And he says, uh, again, thanks to all involved in talks tonight. You have only been able to dip in uh, to the live post with Fabulous. All, um, and of course, you can catch up, Mark, on our YouTube channel. Yeah. All the talks go up there. And Mark is related to uh, the Michael Sweeney that was mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that took part mm -hmm. in the halfway house attack. Yes. Yes. Um, and then... Tola, again, just in relation to the Ascendry Warfare, uh, the IRA had at that time developed a functional compact clockwork incendiary, and he's seen the original sketch plans. So, um, as you say, yeah. Michal, they were a learning army, yeah. they were oh, adapting oh, oh. all the time. Um, yeah. Okay, Excellent. everyone just hang on. For, if you want to talk there, Kathy, amongst yourselves, and Michal, I'm just going to look up my <laughs> head. <laughs> That's great. That's absolutely great. I'll be taking yeah, a, a, little, <laughs> it's taking a little breather. break actually yeah, um, yeah, over the next yeah. few weeks because now with the lockdown lifted, we just feel like I need to get out of the house for a little while and start exploring again. So uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, what you should have been doing here was getting 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 some room service in though. <laughs> you think that you cups of tea or coffee or something stronger keep you going. You're, you're, I, but I mean, look, I think all you've proved so far tonight is what I said at the beginning, your enthusiasm. It's infectious. It's incredible. It's absolutely wonderful. And I think people like you are what we need here. We need them locally. And we need that to generate through to the, the national heroes, we, uh, historians. They, they get stuck. They just mm -hmm. see a big picture. They can't see the detail. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you don't see the people, I mean, Liz talked about the word archaeology earlier, or you, you did what it was called. I mean, archaeology is what you've got left when you take people out. Yeah. Mm. You know, and you need people to make history. Mm. And, you know, you talk about them, Liz talks about them, I talk about them. Um, you know, so many other great local historians do this. Um, but at, at a bigger, a higher level, there's, there's, there's a cache of historians who don't see them, who don't come down to them. I just wish they would. They, mm. you know, they, they would be better historians for it, mm. I think, if they could do that. Anyway, that's my rant over. <laughs> I, I found it and I, I put it up there, so uh, I yeah, got it for Mark. Um, and I, again, Michal, like we, um, we are yeah. the, the prime examples of this, of, you yeah. know, li just listening to just reaching out and seeing, you know, what is out there. And thankfully the people have responded to us mm -hmm. because we certainly could, yeah. would not be telling the stories that we are telling today without the, yeah. the, 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 the people um, who yeah. know an awful lot more than the academics in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, us, um, enough said there. Um, okay, <laughs> I think that is all the questions, Cathy. Oh my God, you, you need a strong yeah. drink after this. Um, uh, I'm just going to do um, a plug for next week's talk. So I'm going to share my screen and see if mm. this works. Uh, let me see. No, I'm actually losing this. Uh, okay. Can I share mine? Yeah, have you, have you got it there, Michal? Yeah, if I'm up to share. Okay. Um, there it goes. Um, oh, sorry. What I'm just uh, sharing here is, is our one for the, um, if you can see oh. that, where you can get all these talks back. Okay. Brilliant. Tinyurl.com, May 25, burning. Okay. Uh, and now I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I have it here, Michal. Yeah. Okay. You got it. I got it there. Yeah. And so everyone following on from uh, Kathy's talk, I'm delighted um, to announce that Joe Mooney of the Eastwall History Group is going to give us, um, do a talk for us next week. Now, 
this Joe is is amazing. If any of you um, have not seen the film that was made, a documentary made by the East Wall History Group, um, it's the uh, Peace and War in a Docklands Hotel, and it's about the attack on the LNWR Hotel on North Wall, which has a direct link to the Custom House. Joe um, is originally from Crumlin, but um, Joe lives in East Wall. Um, and him and Hugo McGuinness do amazing work down there. Um, so Joe, he's going to do the talk for us next week. And the talk is called, and I just have to move this out of the way so I can get the full title, um, The Old Spot by the River, Liberty Hall, Custom House, and the Dublin Dockland Rebels. So everyone, it's the usual time, 8 o'clock, um, and it's on the 15th of May. And we would be delighted to um, to, to see us all there. It is going to be a, a, a brilliant talk. And as I said, if you haven't seen the documentary, if you go on to the East Wall for All webpage, and also they do have their own Facebook group, the East Wall History Group Facebook mm -hmm. group. Um, they have a YouTube channel as well. And you'll be able to see the documentary there. It was uh, premiered on the 11th of April, the centenary of the attack on the LNWR Hotel. So um, that will be a, a good one to tune into next week to talk with Joe Mooney. Um, right, I will just do one more scan because I'm just, um, yeah. I don't want to miss any, Cathy, but... Um, Mischievous it, one there from Jenny Doyle. <laughs> Can the team take us through their library of books? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <forget this. laughs> oh. I don't think Zoom would last long enough. <laughs> you need to do a whole presentation, me hold yourself. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we've I think mm. we've gotten all the questions and my apologies to anyone if I did miss mm. any comments. Um I think that yeah. is Oh, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's it. I think. Yeah. So I suppose yeah. everyone, again, thank you so much for for tuning in. We we really could not do this without you because we would end up just being talking to ourselves. Um, <laughs> we always learn yeah. something from you. So like after after talk, myself and Michal always have like yeah. a a powwow and go. I didn't know yeah. that. I didn't know that. Oh my God, this is fascinating. So <laughs> we always get something Every from time. you, the yeah. audience. So it's great to have that um, that that interaction with you um, because yeah. I know Michal and Cathy, we, mm. we do not know everything and we don't mm. admit to know everything. So we're yeah. always willing to yeah. learn more and you yeah. have been so great, so gracious in giving us that yeah. information. Yeah. Um, can I just say, um, on a personal level, Cathy is, is a very dear friend of mine and um, I'm just so thrilled that she took part in the, the events for the centenary of the morning of the Custom House. Um, as Michal said, it oozes of Cathy. She cannot hide her love for the, the, the area where she was raised, where she's from, which is Dublin A. And um, if you didn't know that before tonight, um, Cathy is a bit biased about the 4th Battalion area because it is her stomping ground. Um, <laughs> a bit like myself. <laughs> Cathy, you have done a wonderful, wonderful talk yeah. for us. Um, and you really highlighted how a local community story is central um, and just as important to the national story um, that involves the big names. We would have nothing without the ordinary men and women who took part mm -hmm. and who played that role in the support role, the people we don't know about in Intracore mm -hmm. Works. Um, but you have recognised their um, involvement by telling this story. Mm -hmm. So on behalf of myself and Michal, um, just a huge, huge, huge thank you. Um, and everyone, thank you for tuning in tonight. And I'll hand you over now to Michal just to say the final thank you to our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Thanks, thanks again to the the, the Minister for Housing, Local Government, and uh, Heritage, uh, Dara O'Brien, uh, and to all in the Custom House, to 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 Tim, to Sean, to to, to Jerry, etc. All of them there, but most especially, I agree with Liz. A thanks to Cathy. Um, we do learn something every time. Um, you know, we started out with one talk thirteen years ago, and we've had. God knows how many talks in the meantime, and each and every one of them has added to what we've, we've gained from it. 
Um, you know, we've been able to publish six different books on the subject. Uh, more to come, we know that. But everybody is interested now. Everybody sees, everybody hears, everybody knows the story and knows the peripheral story. So know that it's centered in the history, that it's not the history in itself. Um, so look, all I can say is thanks a million, Cathy, for again, a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, and we'll, we hope to do this again some other time. <laughs> <laughs> so to everybody out there, thanks a million. We're back next week. So, uh, good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.